What I want to talk to you about today is um, the experience economy, which is not a new concept. It's been around for oh, 20 years or so. But um, there are some interesting things in, uh, in, the, in the experience economy that are yeah, of interest to us as Congress organizers. And I think we should be aware of that. What I want to look at is how, is the, how does it work? What is the experience economy? How does it apply to us? Is it as relevant today as it was 20 years ago? What has been the impact of the pandemic uh, on the experience economy? Because when you talk about experiences and you talk about a pandemic and people staying home, not traveling, not going to live conferences, can you still talk about experiences? Um, I'll look at some uh, you know, recent publications about the experience economy and how that is perceived. And then I want to talk with you about how we can apply this day to day in our organizing of conferences. And then uh, I'll just draw one or two more conclusions. And that's it. Now, I would love to explain to you how the experience uh, economy works, but I'm going to actually hand over to a gentleman called Joe Pine. Joe Pine, he literally wrote the book about the experience economy about 20 years ago. In a nutshell, the experience uh, economy is consumers buying experiences rather than goods or services or commodities. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little video that uh, he's recorded. You can find this back on YouTube if ever you want to see it again. It's about 18 minutes. He does the presentation of the concept and he does it infinitely better than me. So I thought I'd introduce this in, in my presentation. And then we'll take you through the, the discussion and the steps that follow, okay? For this video, I, I recommend that you pump up the volume because especially in the beginning, the sound is a little bit low. It's just the quality of the video. It's nothing to do with the transmission. So be ready to make your volume maximum so you'll hear him well. And I will put on the switch on the subtitles so that you can also see the words that he speaks, okay? So enjoy this, and then we'll talk a bit more.
What that means is that fundamentally goods and services are no longer enough. Goods and services are everywhere becoming mere commodities. And that means it's time to move to a new level of economic value to go beyond the goods and services to staging experiences for your customers. Now, the most important thing to understand about this progression of economic value, remember nothing else from our time together this morning, I want you to remember this. Experiences are a distinct economic offering. As distinct from services as services are from goods. But space when you use goods as prompt, services as the stage to engage each and every individual in an inherently personal way, and thereby create a memory, which is the hallmark of the experience. So we're shifting into an experience economy. That's where growth is going to come from in jobs and in GDP now and in the future. And that is where we need to innovate. We need to innovate in experience. This hit home for me a number of years ago when I was in Milan, Italy, giving a boardroom presentation to a number of different executives. And one of them was the vice president of Maxwell House in, in Italy. And he said something that floored me. He said, you know, there, there's been no innovation in the coffee industry in 15 years. I said, are, are you yeah. kidding me? You've never heard of Starbucks? <laughs> For him, innovation wasn't good. There were manufacturers. Like, yes, Langer thought we only innovate in goods. Totally missing the innovation in the coffee drinking experience that Howard Schultz created at Starbucks. The irony, of course, being was actually Milan, Italy, that inspired Howard Schultz to bring back that great coffee experience that he saw there back to the United States, now increasingly export around the world. Now, contrast what Maxwell House did or didn't do with Nestle and its Nespresso brand. In the face of Starbucks increasingly controlling coffee consumption around the world, Nespresso innovated. They came up with this capsule system where the, the, they say the best cafe is your cafe. Not subtext, not out there in Starbucks, but the one in your own home. And they innovated an espresso machine. Now, yes, this is a physical good, but they designed it in such a way that just using an espresso machine is an experience. And then they innovated their own experience place, the Nespresso boutique, where you can come in, you can sit down, you can be exposed to all the products. They can make a cup of coffee just for you on the Nespresso machine. Knowing that if they get you to experience the product before you buy it, the chances you will buy it, in fact, go up. And they didn't stop there. They innovated in services with an espresso club, where they allowed you to automatically replenish your particular paper capsules delivered automatically to your home. And then it just seems the basic principle of the experience economy that when you get into station experiences, it just doesn't hurt if you're a movie, you're a person. Now, if you think about coffee, that it perfectly exemplifies this progression of economic value that I'm talking about. Because coffee at its core is what? Right? What's coffee? Right, beans. It's beans. You, you, you know it's a commodity. You can actually look up the future price of coffee in the Wall Street Journal every morning. But if you convert that from a per bushel to a per cup basis, per cup and you treat it as a commodity, two or three cents. That's how much the coffee in your cup of coffee is worth, the beans are worth. But if you take those beans, you roast them, grind them, package them, put them on a grocery store shelf like Maxwell House does, now you get 5, 10, 15 cents per cup of coffee. If you actually brew it for the customer in a vending machine, a corner diner, a kiosk, a Dunkin' Donuts or 7-Eleven somewhere, now you get 50 cents, dollar, dollar and a half per cup of coffee. But then surround the brewing of that coffee with the ambiance and theater of a Starbucks. And now how much you pay? Three, four, five, six dollars per cup of coffee with only two or three cents worth of beans in it. Four distinct levels of value totally dependent on what business the company makes. Now, Starbucks actually doesn't hold the record for a cup of coffee. I had the opportunity a, a couple of years ago to take my wife to Venice. And there, of course, we went to the Piazza San Marco. And I bought her a cup of coffee at the Cafe Florian. And you know, we spent over an hour there soaking in all the sights and sounds that most old world of Italian cities. And then I got the bill. You know how much a, a cup of plain old black coffee cost at the Cafe Florian? 13 and a half euros. 13 and a half euros. Was it worth it? Assolutamente. You create a great experience and your customers are going to pay you commensurately for that experience. But you need to create a great experience. You need to create an amazing experience, a remarkable experience. You need to create a distinctive experience. One of the things that has happened since the um, uh, publication of our book is the entire movement towards customer experience. Now, one of the things that most people mean when they say customer experience, they create a, a concept of, of customer experience. 
most people, not everybody, but most people, what do they mean? They mean, let's make our interactions with customers nice and easy and convenient. And nice and easy and convenient are all well and good, but they're service characteristics. They're not the characteristics of a true distinctive experience. If you want to create a true distinctive experience off in the province of a CXO, the chief experience officer, then what you need to do is not just make your things nice. I mean, nice is nice, but nice rarely rises to the level of memorable. And a true distinctive experience has to be memorable, creating that memory within people. And when we make things easy, often what we do is they make them easy on us. We root nice things, so we make the same for everybody. And that gets in the way of making things personal. Experiences are inherently personal. Where do experiences actually happen? Inside of us. It's our reaction to the events that are staged inside of us. You need to reach inside of people. You need to engage them and make that experience personal. And then convenience. Convenience is actually the antithesis of what I am talking about. Convenience means let's get in and out as quickly as possible. Let's spend as little time with the company as possible. And I'm talking about how do you get your customers to value that time that they spend with you. Right, that's key with an experience. When you think about it this way, in every one of these economic changes, there's always a gray line that you put in there that differentiates one from another. And the key one between services and experiences is all about time. It's about time. With a service, what people are looking for is time well saved. In fact, people increasingly want services as well as goods commoditized so they can spend their hard-earned money and their hard-earned time on the experiences that they want. With experiences, what you need to do is you need to provide time well spent. Time well spent, that they value the time that they spend with you in the place that you have created. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical place. You can create an experience even over the phone line, as Zappos does, where they don't measure the average hold time that rep the reps have, which is how measuring how little time we spend with customers. They, in fact, every day celebrate the representative today who got to spend the most time with the customer over the phone. You know what the record is? 10 hours, 43 minutes. With one break. That they celebrate every day. Because they recognize that's how you deliver happiness. And notice that what Tony Shea Staples wants to do is not just deliver happiness to customers. He wants to deliver happiness to employees as well. And that is key. If you want your employees to create a, to stage a great experience for your customers, then you need to give them the wherewithal to be able to do that. And it starts in recruiting. And one company that does that is actually the United States Army, which created AmericasArmy.com, which is a downloadable game. You download this game, you go on a mission, you succeed on it, but then the Army lets you download the second game. Now it's a multi-user game. Now you're getting together with other people as part of a troop. And if you succeed at that mission, well, then the Army would like to recruit you. Over 25% of the people who now go into Army first experience this at AmericasArmy.com at a cost one-tenth of normal advertising. And once you recruit, you need to train. Whirlpool has created the appliance manufacturers, created the real world program uh, in uh, Michigan where they bought a house modeled after uh, MTV's real world program where you take all these people, you put them in the house, and you don't make little leave, and you fill them all in the interaction. So here you have to stay in this house during the 10 week program. They don't reimburse for any hotel expenses. You have to cook your own meals in the house using Whirlpool appliances. They don't reimburse for meal expenses. You have to do your own laundry in the house using Whirlpool appliances. They don't reimburse for any laundry expenses. And what they found is that when they train people in this way, creating a true experience out of it, that their retention rate has skyrocketed over a number of different years. And now in their 15th year, uh, with the real world program. You, you recruit them, you train them, then you need to create a holistic experience. One that really does give your employees the wherewithal. St. Lena Hospital, for example, in California, has as a theme of experience, sowing seeds of abundance. It's about sowing seeds of abundance. So we want to give our employees, give them abundant lives. So from that abundance, they can create an abundant experience for their patients. Abundant experience for the family members, an abundant experience for the entire community. They recognize how important experiences are for uh, their employees, right? That they need to create time well spent for employees. Because if you don't do that, then what's going to happen to your employees is they're just going to have time spent watching the clock. That's different. Now, another basic principle of the experience economy 
is understand that when you stage experiences, you are now competing against the world. You are competing against the world for the time, the attention, and the money of individual customers. And time is limited. We can only experience things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to sleep in there sometimes. And if somebody does capture my time while I'm spending my time with some other company, what am I not doing? I'm not spending that time with you. In the same way, attention is increasingly scarce. In today's media fragmented world, it's hard to capture people's attention with normal advertising that. But if I create experience, I get people to spend their time with me, what am I doing? I'm giving them my attention. What am I not doing? I'm not giving that attention to you. And the same way, money is consumable. If I have a dollar to spend, I spend in some other company, in some other geographic area, in some other industry, what can I do with that dollar again? I can't spend it with you. It's gone. So you need to understand a basic principle of the experience economy is that the experience is the marketing. The experience is the marketing. The best way to generate demand for your offering is with an experience so engaging that customers can't help but spend their time with you, give you their attention, and then buy your offering as a result. So if you buy a grand piano from Steinway, right, it costs over $100,000, don't be surprised if they ask you if they can throw a concert in your own home. They ask you for the friends and neighbors who like to fight that concert. The night of the concert, they have ballet parking outside, they serve wine or dirt inside. Then they hire a professional concertina to play your own piano in your own home. And you know that's the best that piano is ever going to sound. The night of that concert. And the gentleman told us about this, said that Steinway did a wonderful job. The pianist was magnificent. And after the concert, two of his friends bought pianos for their home. And that's what I mean. The experience is the market. And it works for incredibly high involvement, expensive products. It works for incredibly low involvement and inexpensive products. This is probably in here in Times Square, the Charmin restroom experience. When you go under that awning there, you go up these escalators, we have brand ambassadors that are singing the praises of Charmin. I mean, literally singing the praises of Charmin. Uh, you wait in queue for your time to use a, a restroom where they have the ultimate restroom experience. They clean it after every use. When you're in there, you have your toilet paper menu. You have six different varieties of toilet paper you can use. And when you're done, you can sing and dance with the Charmin mascot. You can get your picture taken on the world's largest toilet. And the first year they did this, they had over 200,000 people expose themselves, if you pardon the expression, to Charmin toilet paper. And sales went up 14%. 14%. And you think about Apple. I can still remember when Steve Jobs back in 2002 announced that Apple was getting into retail and he got lambasted in the business press. But he proved them wrong by creating not just a store, but an amazing experience. Now, obviously, it's predicated on great products. If Apple didn't have great products, well, then the experience wouldn't matter, matter so much. But you combine great products with great experiences, right? that's when magic can happen. And you see it not just with manufacturers, you can see it with uh, service companies as well. ING Direct, for example, came over to the U.S. from the Dutch marketplace with no name recognition and no branches. What they did instead is they created cafes, the ING Direct Cafe, where you walk in there and you get a very European-style bistro. You order a cup of coffee, maybe biscotti from the financial baristas, and that barista then comes and engages you in conversation about your financial needs. You move savings account over to ING accounts and refinance your mortgage with ING funds. And amazingly, it works. Every time they open up a new cafe, it generates over $200 million in new accounts for ING. Now, ING Direct was actually bought by Cap One, thanks to that other purchase, it's now the fifth largest bank in the country. Now, this is this is actually a, a picture of, of my family when we went to the opportunity to go to Iceland last year. And that's me and my wife there, and my daughter, Decca, and Lizzie, and Decca's husband, Ryan. And this actually has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But but my accountant said if I showed it to you, I'd be able to write it off of my taxes. I also had the opportunity to take the family to Vegas. And Vegas, of course, is the experience capital of the world. Everything is about Vegas experience. And they use marketing experiences to generate demand even for their own experiences, such as Bellagio with a fountain show that draws people all over Las Vegas, so then they come and experience Bellagio itself. But again, it doesn't have to be done just physically. You can do this virtually as well. Every one of these places, 
an experience hub online, just like Las Vegas is an experience hub in the real world. So you have companies like Blendtec that nobody had ever heard of until the CEO, Tom Dixon, started using YouTube to put on all these videos about will it blend. And if you've never seen one of these, you need to see one. And, and they've had over, they've had hundreds of millions of views and sales went up 700%. And obviously that is lightning in the bottle. You can't expect that to happen in your business. But that's what can happen if you create great marketing experiences. And whether you do that for uh, consumers, whether you do that for employees, such as marketing, recruiting experiences and that, or whether you do it for business, business customers like Blendtec, right? you can create marketing experiences that generate demand. In fact, my favorite business-to-business -business company that does this is Case Construction. Case Construction has created the Tomahawk Experience Center in the Northwoods of Wisconsin, where they bring customers up basically to play with the equipment. You know, it's a big sandbox. They have rodeos and contests. You can move the most amount of dirt the shortest amount of time. And they did a study and found out a customer goes up to a number, uh, to, a, to a regular dealer of theirs. They have perhaps a 20% chance to get their business. They bring them up to Tomahawk. It goes up to 80%. 20% to 80% because the experience is marketing. So let me simply close by saying that you can stay in the illusory safety of past practice and keep on doing the same thing you've always been doing. Well, then mark my words, you will be commoditized. Or you can shift up this progression of economic value to staging experiences for each one of your individual customers, and then you'll be economically rewarded. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Well, there you go. I hope that was entertaining. I hope you got a good listen to it and that you saw the whole presentation clearly. I've seen it at least a dozen times. And uh, I keep being surprised by how impactful experiences can be and how it works. You know, if I, if I just run back through some of the examples we saw, the Nespresso store and the concept of making your own coffee at home with this whole beautiful machine, Starbucks and how they created a whole happening out of serving coffee. Uh, the case construction, this Tomahawk experience, I think that's amazing, really. If you, if you have a 20% chance of selling something to a customer, and through this experience and it goes to 80 percent that's real money that's real value that you create there and the apple store of course was an example well, we've seen we've seen a lot of examples there and i think i think that was really instructive on how experiences work so a few things a few things we heard right because you may have seen this video for the first time i just want to remind you of some of the points that we heard commodities goods and services are no longer enough we we're talking about experience experiences are where innovations will happen Right? That's where we need to innovate. Commodities, goods, and services will go really to the commodity side. And you know, when you're, when you're competing on commodities, uh, then you're competing on price. And so you need to do innovation. Innovation, according to them, happens in the experience arena. And experience in itself is a distinct value proposition. It is, it is not, it's supported by the goods and services, but in itself, it is something people will pay for. It's a distinct value proposition. You're competing against the world, the world for time, attention, and money. Because as, as Joe explained it, you can you know, spend your time on one experience. You're not spending that time on other experiences. The same thing with your attention. When your attention is grabbed by one experience, that attention cannot go elsewhere. And the money you have, you can spend it only once. So if you spend it on something, that's gone. The money is unlimited. Um, and he, he used this very nice example. The experience is the marketing. He said that several times. He gave the Steinway piano as, a, as an example, you know, you would buy for a hundred thousand dollars or more a piano and the whole thing is delivered at your home. They'll propose a concert at home. Someone comes to play the piano. People are invited and they may actually buy some pianos because they've seen that wonderful experience. And this is where the experience becomes the marketing. So in itself, very good word of mouth, right? What else did we hear? Nice, easy, and convenient are service elements. They're not personable, they're not experienced. Now, this is something we need to really, really remember because we're in the business of organizing conferences. I've talked about, I talk about the PCO angle here, really. And what, what we always do is we try to run a conference that is smooth, uh, registration processes that are smooth and easy. Uh, people don't waste time, but it's very important. He says, there are important elements, but they are not experiences because we try to do things fast, whereas the experience should be a memorable thing. And this is not when it's nice, easy, and convenient. This is aimed at a whole audience. And the experience should be personal, and it should be memorable. 
inherently personable. And as he said, service is about time well saved, whereas experiences are about time well spent. Let me, let me show you that graph one more time, right? So he talked about the basic commodities from which you, that you extract, from which you make goods. He gave the example of coffee, coffee beans, coffee bags. Then you can serve this coffee in a restaurant or in a bar. That becomes a service. You deliver the service. And until then, there you want to be uh, efficient. You want to be smooth. You want to have people have a good experience. But it's not yet the wow thing, the memorable thing. That becomes the Starbucks, the, the time well spent. That's where you want to go. That's, that's the, 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 the image that he, he showed us, right? So <clears throat> knowing that this is the experience economy, how have things changed? Since the pandemic, let's have a look. What I did is I did some research to see how people talk about and write about the experience economy today, because this book has been out for 20 years, and this 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 uh, thinking about the experience economy has been going on for some 20 years. Has it changed? Has the pandemic had an effect on this? People working from home, people not traveling, people not coming to conference centers, everything being done digitally now. So here's what I found. I found an article in. Forbes magazine from April this year, so fairly recent, really, and Forbes, a, a good quality uh, magazine. And uh, the author, did, he picked up on some very interesting points that I want to run by. For instance, a survey of almost 2,000 business professionals found that for 46% of the respondents, customer experience is a top priority for the next five years. Can you imagine? About half of the people said customer experience is a top priority for the next five years. They know where the competition is going to be, the customer experience. And it also said that 86% of buyers pay a premium for a good experience. You can actually monetize experience. If you create a good experience, people will pay for it and they will pay a premium for it. Customer experience overtakes product and price as the key brand differentiator. And that makes sense, right? Because it's, it's the feeling that you get when you buy your iPhone or when you have an espresso coffee or that you, you know you're dealing with a brand because they have created an experience for you. It's memorable. So if, if you didn't know it already, the proof is that the experience economy is here. It is here and it's here to stay. Without a doubt, the single largest enabler of experience is technology. Now, that is a very interesting statement to make because it facilitates innovation, personalized engagement, granular insight, and next best recommendations, which are the foundation of experiences. With, with technology, you can actually follow you know, in our world as well, digital conferences. You know who logs in, what sessions they visit, how long they stay. It allows you to have more insight, more detailed insight in what your customers are doing. And that allows you to recommend better experiences. He said that in the past 12 to 15 months of the pandemic, digitization has played a vital role in keeping experiences alive, both uh, in the consumption category and for the businesses providing them digitization played a vital role in keeping experiences alive. And it's not so odd. Remember the example that, uh, that Joe gave in his presentation of will it blend? I don't know if you've ever seen these, these videos. They're crazy, they're on YouTube, they're everywhere. This guy puts on his glasses, his goggles, and his, he puts on his coat and he takes a blender and he puts an iPhone in the blender and he starts blend, will it blend? You know, everybody wants to see that, of course. And it blends, but it was great publicity. And that's just marketing, that's a digital experience. But, and he warns, access to technology or investment alone does not guarantee a winning experience. Most often the human element, the human element is the single largest differentiator coming into play as empathy, engagement, personalization, and immersiveness. So you need to get your whole process well done, but there's a part of the experience that is created by the human element, the human interaction, and that makes a real difference. And this makes perfect sense because experience is inseparable from the human being who's going through it, right? We're human beings. We live the experience. It happens inside of us, as Joe says. So by definition, the experience economy is one where experience creates economic value. Economic value is distinctive for itself. So this means that organizations with the best experience should be able to charge for it. So this is what where we, this is the challenge for us. Can we create the best possible experiences so that we can charge for it and that people say, this is the sort of conference I don't ever want to miss again because this is the best, right? This is the experience. 
So as I said, it would be interactive and I'm open to comments and, 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 and remarks. Uh, how can TCOs create experiences? I'd love to hear a few ideas or examples. What, what do you think when you hear this story? If you, if you want to unmute yourself, maybe show your, yourself on camera and shout something out, that would be great. What can we do to create experiences? Natalie, I see you're switching on your camera, but you're still muted, so I can't hear you. <coughs> Carol, anything? How do we create experiences as PCOs? Jerrion, well, I think could you just unshare screen? That way we can do the gallery and we'll be able to see each other a little bit better. I can do that. That's a very good Thanks. suggestion. Come on. I think one way to share experiences is to really understand who your customer is and be able to design to, to meet their specific needs. I know some of the things we've been talking about is that, you know, and for, for, our, for our client organizations and then, you know, through consulting is you cannot go back to 2019 at this point. You have to rethink what is that quote experience gonna look like for in-person events if, if you have a component and um, really dig deeper on your customer needs and design it because many organizations, you know, think, well, we can just go back to 2019, right? That's when everything was great. Um, so it's really thinking through who is your customer. Yeah, that's an excellent point because as, as it's uh, highlighted throughout the presentation, experiences are personal. So knowing your customer, knowing their needs is an essential step to creating great experiences for the people. Anybody else? Yeah, I just wanted to share my um, view on this, which is actually, hi, it's Julia from uh, from AIM Group, Italy. Um, I actually partially agree with what's, what uh, was said now uh, two minutes ago about understanding who your customer is, but also understanding what, what could be the solution or the answer to their needs, what could be identifying their daily struggles. I mean, we're now going on a negative side, but what are their daily struggles? What are their daily challenges? And how can we then help to give them a way to really focus on what they need so that we can create an experience towards that? And the experience itself, and this is my second element, is that the experience should not be seen as like I go to a venue and I see people and I talk to people and I learn something, but it has to really be a, a kind of five senses experience. Because um, the event itself is not about just the logistical organizations, the operational organization of it, but it's also a blend of how, what do you communicate in that moment. And the communication of this experience is like the sound, the music that you, that you can hear when you enter the venue. Uh, what, what do you see? Which colors are you seeing? What kind of setup do you see? Uh, which kind of feelings does this event arise, arise in, in the people and the persons that are joining the event? So it's just a lot of different things. So just my three points is know your customers' challenges and find a solution to that blend the organizational aspect with the communication aspect and the experience should be a five senses experiences that's interesting five senses that's a that's a nice one and you know i think i think you're onto something because uh, an experience like that makes it memorable what i what i do want to underline and that is also very important in the way joe uh, presents his concept is that he says, do try to make it personable. So in the, in, the, in the point that Carol made before, if you know your participant, you know your customer really, really well, you will see that uh, same solution doesn't always work for, the, for, for everybody in the same way. And that's why he makes the difference in his presentation between services and making everything smooth and, and good for everybody, you know, like a registration area that runs like clockwork, where you don't have long lines, where you get everything you need, where everything is in order. But that is the same for everybody. Now, what does it, what makes it an experience that it makes it unique to you because you're actually like that. Now, you could play with the senses, absolutely. Some people will say, I felt wonderful. It made me warm and fuzzy. I felt at home, I felt relaxed. I was much better at engaging with people because of that setting. So that could work. But keep, keep in mind that if you really want to go far, try and go 
go personal, to identify the individual needs of the people, right? Maybe that's, um, if, I, if, I, if I share my screen again, let's see if I can do this. I know how to do these things, but I'm very good at conferences. Up there, let's see, that should be coming up now. Share. Are we good? Are we good? Let me move on. Let me give you an example of what, what we could do as, a, as, an, uh, as an organization. We start with something really simple and big data, personalized program content recommendations for conferences based on individual preferences. People register, they may have to answer a questionnaire, you know something about their job title, you know something about their location, geographical positioning, etc. And based on that, you can start making personalized recommendations. This is where in the article they say, digital has really created an enormous, huge opportunity for experiences to become personal because we're much better at measuring and, and, and slicing and dicing information about people. So this is one way of, of making an experience, a conference or online conference, for instance, very, very personal. Another one could be to create personalized workshops at digital and hybrid conferences based on individual interests. Like we run in live sessions, we run parallel sessions. You can go infinitely further when you do everything online. You can create very small groups, target groups of only eight people where people get a chance to say and participate based on the information that you've gathered about them and that they have expressed themselves. So again, it becomes very personal and very satisfying, satisfying because they learn something exactly about the topic that they wanted to address. Um, you can go further. You can say, okay, we select association content like meetings, publications, training programs based on the preferences that we distill from online participation in digital and hybrid conferences. So we look at where are people going? Which sessions are they attending? How long do they stay? Were they interactively involved? And use artificial intelligence and data management to figure out these people will be interested in those topics. So after the conference is over, we re-engage with them and we start feeding them exactly that sort of information that is targeted at them, really on the individual. People will say, wow, this is amazing. They have so well understood what my needs are. I keep on working with this association. I stay in touch. I want, to, I want to do more with them, right? It's their share of attention, they will spend money, their share of wallet, it will all go to that association that really understands the needs of the individual. And the human touch, of course, whether it's online or at a live conference, you can create individual match and meet programs at conferences based on personal needs and preferences. People want to interact with people. Uh, we mentioned that point earlier, you know, that the human aspect, the human element enhances the whole experience. This technology will take it very far, but if you can make it human, you really touch the people where, where, where the emotion sits. And again, it can make it memorable. People make friends for lives at conferences, be it online or in the live sessions. So again, something that stimulates interaction between people based on very specifically identified needs can create a great match and meet program. And that will create memorable experiences for people who keep coming back for more and more. They feel that this community is relevant to them. I hope that makes sense. You can come up with 10,000 examples, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, there are so many ways of, of, of touching the, the people, making it memorable and making it personal. That, that is what it's all about, to create the experiences. And it's not limited to the physical presence, the digital presence, like we saw with the blenders or with, the, with other examples, videos, with the digital marketing, they can make things very, very personal. Warning light, Joe Pine says, if you safely keep on doing what you've always been doing, you will be commoditized. I think that's a very important lesson to remember from, from this session. If you, um, if you don't move up to that next level, you know, from, uh, from commodities to products to services, all the way to experiences, that's where the competition place, takes place. Brands will be remembered because of the experiences that they create. If you, if you don't do that, you're fighting in the commodity fight. And that's where you can only fight on price. That means the margins are getting smaller and smaller. It's more difficult to make your money, to make your profits. You don't want to be there. That's a red ocean. You, know, you want to be in that area where you can distinguish yourself from others by creating memorable experiences for an individual. And they keep coming back for more. That, that's, the, that's the trick. That being said, that's... And in a nutshell, that is my presentation. That's me highlighting why I think that the experience economy is still very... In the pandemic, the digital presence of everybody has accelerated some of those elements. You can better slice and dice, you can better measure 
the things that you do in the experience economy. And that gives us new and fresh opportunities to create more experiences for people. And we as organizers working with associations should think of these things to make our clients stand out, to make them look good, to make their brands recognizable so that the time that their participants and their members share with them are memorable and personable and they keep coming back for more. Are there any questions or comments people want to make? I'll stop sharing my screen so we can go back to the um, theater setting. Is there anybody who would like to ask, say something? I'm open to comments. Jurian, we have a comment from Alberto. He's not in a quiet place, so he, he'd rather not speak. Um, so his questions are, we need to ask ourselves these three questions. Who is our future customer? What kind of experience will we create for them? And third, what are we investing in to make this experience possible? Okay, I like that question. So that's a good question. Who's our future customer? You know, here at MCI, we use a model, which is interesting. It's, it's, it's a mindset model. We, we call it third box thinking. So what we say is we are in the first box. Our, our client, the association, is in the second box. And the participant or the member is in the third box. It's the client of the client. If we can solve a problem for the third box, we become the best friend of the second box, right? We become a, a valuable partner. So thinking about who is the customer of the future is, who is this association that I'm trying to address? One of the problems associations are facing at the moment is renewing the membership. Young people do not necessarily join associations anymore. Uh, they find their happiness and their information on the, online in, in, in groups and in social media platforms. So how can we make associations relevant for this target group? And if we can figure that out, we are the best partner for them to work with. And I think really that's one of the questions, the younger generations and how to engage with them is an important part. It's no longer about membership. It's about who we engage with. People buy pieces and bits of, of an association. And that's what we have to help our clients to, to, to sell. So the, the future customer is someone who engages with an association who probably needs 24-7, 365 uh, contact with the association. And the association needs to be a source of very personalized, very uh, relevant information for those, for those people. That's the customer of the future. And the, the experience is, I, I would say, 24-7, 365 personalized, no longer pushing information out, but reading, trying to analyze what a person needs and providing them exactly with what they need. That is the sort of uh, experience that we have to create for them. Third point was, uh, what are we investing in to make this experience possible? Technology, data, artificial intelligence. A lot of these things will happen online, I think in parallel with live meetings and in parallel with other forms of engagement. But online is going to be very, very powerful. As the article in Forbes said, it's going to be very helpful in creating experiences also in the future. Were there any other questions? I see there were some notes on the, on the comments. Thank you for stressing out the uh, generation gap of our customers' customers. Um, you really got me when you said, oh, uh, yeah, we really wanted to provide a smooth clockwork like registration project, clockwork, 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 go, go to the session. Okay, goodbye. But the newer generation might like to take a selfie. Oh, I'm here. So we as the, as the organizer should provide a nice environment, not only a counter with welcome, but maybe a selfie box. Now I'm here to share it on social media. Hmm. That's a good. That's a good idea. What we once did for our conferences, we uh, we not organ only organized the logistics of the meeting, but we did an assessment with the association of who are the typical participants who come to this conference. And it was a medical conference, so we looked at doctors in the different stages of their professional career. The student who had just graduated, the doctor who's been practicing for a while, he works in a hospital, he's running, uh, she's running her own practice. Uh, he or she is a consultant later in life. And we tried to create personas and we made cut out carton boards, personas of these people, placed them in the registration area, wrote up a profile about who they are and what their challenges are. And we linked that to the conference program and said, this is where you can find more information about those points. Consider following track blue or 
consider coming on the Tuesday afternoon for these and these sessions, and you will find something about it. So people could identify with a persona or parts of a persona, and then find how that related to the conference that was running. It makes it personable. Hello. Una Bang, you have a question. Hi, and um, Jorain, am I pronounced correct with your name? You can call me anything you want as long as you don't call me later. Then. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Sometimes it's difficult for us to ask questions because, you know, <laughs> I want to make sure I pronounce the name correctly. And, you know, I work as a sales uh, with the design background. So most of the time, and uh, I need to print our company at like E-Star. And uh, I know it's not very strong, like... Um, Starbucks, Apple. So sometimes, and uh, we want to uh, tell our clients, and uh, we want to give you a unique appearance. And uh, most time, I think um, Brin is like telling a story. And uh, do you have any like suggestion if we want to try uh, to get attention with them? What's the important key to you know get them to involved with this? So how do, your question is, how do I help uh, convince clients to get on board with creating more experiences and, and, and working on their brand? Yes, like we, when we're telling the story, like I know knowing the client's needing is the most important. And uh, besides that, how do I get, you know, um, better, you know, like um, first time to interactive and uh, I contacting something like that? Okay, um, in my experience, um, we work in service companies, right? And so we sell services. We don't sell goods. Goods are easy to yes. compare, a pair of shoes or bricks or ashtrays. Services are, are hard to sell because the customer needs to consume them before they understand how good they are. It's, they're ephemeral. You cannot touch them. You cannot store them. It's, it's very special. So they teach this at business school. They say there are three types of services that you sell. You either sell uh, efficiency, that is good, fast, cheap, you know, the best you yes. sell. Um, uh, uh, experience, um, which is um, people that have done certain things in a, in a way which repeatedly and they show that they are reliable partners because they've done it before. And then there is expertise. The expertise is the third level, which in a service company represents the, the we invent new solutions. Your problem is unique. We're very good at inventing new things. This is a small segment. It's very expensive. You have very brainy and expensive people working in your company to do this. But if you're good at it, you can build up a reputation. We sell a lot of experience as Congress organizers because typically what we do, if a client comes to us and says, can you organize my Congress? 8,000 people, doctors, five days. Have you done this before? We say, look at our CV. We do this all the time. We do eight or 10 of them per year. And we've been doing this for 20 years. That gives confidence to the client. So in this, these typical situations, we sell experience. And for a very experienced buyer who knows what they want and exactly how they want it, what they're going to do is they're going to look for price. So they say, I want a cheaper, faster, better than anybody else. How good can you do this? For our organization, that means you have one project manager, so you have 20 assistants working for that one project manager, and you do everything automatic and as fast as possible. So depending on where your client is and what they need, whether it's a unique solution, whether it is a good experienced team, or whether it's just cheap and fast, that, that's what the arguments you're going to put forward. And that's how you convince their, them to buy your services. Thank you so much. That's great. OK. Are there any other questions? Anybody who wants to share something? Well, I know this session has been recorded. And so uh, I think, Andrei, you will make a, a recording available in some form. If you want to see it again or you want to share it with some of your colleagues, don't hesitate. You can revisit it again. And if you, if you want to address some questions with me directly, you can always you know, reach out to me, drop me an email. You know where to find me or Angela knows where to find me. So don't hesitate. OK, I thank you again for your time and for your attention. I hope this was instructive.